Hello and welcome to this video interview as part of our countdown to COP28 series. Today in the studio, I'm joined by Lindsay Stewart, Head of Investment Stewardship Research at Morningstar. Thanks very much for coming in. Natalie, great to be here. So let's talk about the um, pathway to one and a half degrees. What are the main challenges or barriers to maintaining that or even getting there? You use the word maintaining, and I think that's an interesting point. There's a lot of evidence that says that we are way off track in terms of achieving that 1.5 degree target. So I think a lot of the focus on COP28 will be on corralling everybody, all of the de delegates, to remain invested in aiming for that 1.5 degree target, even if there is a very narrow path to victory in terms of achieving it. I think the fact is that um, maintaining the target and perhaps overshooting it by a little bit is better than aiming for a less ambitious target, people start to lose focus and then possibly overshooting that too. We've seen what the world looks like at the current one to 1 1.2 degrees of warming and already that's causing a, a lot of adverse effects. So we don't, we certainly don't want that to get any, any worse than it is. So I think keeping everybody uh, on track and maintaining that momentum uh, towards 1.5 degrees is gonna be really, really important. Okay, let's talk about our industry that we work in. Um, would you say there's a gap between the targets that investment managers set in terms of decarbonisation and the action that they are actually taking, like the, the gap between walking and the talking, let's say? I think there is a gap. It's still pretty significant. I think that is to be expected. There is a degree of pretty high ambition when these targets are set, and that's absolutely necessary to achieving the goals that, that we already spoken about. I think if we frame decarbonisation and climate change as a system level problem, it's going to take everybody in the system working together. So that's investment management, uh, finance generally, companies, but also the government and policy side to work together to deliver on the solutions that are going to deliver mm. that uh, decarbonisation and that reduction in, in the rate of temperature rise. I think it's pretty pronounced in sort of the, some of the most exposed sectors, certainly the oil and gas sector, but also if you think about uh, essential things that are, we're going to have even in a decarbonized world, steel, cement, mining, that have significant challenges to address, uh, that we need to develop technological and technical solutions to, to uh, achieve that, that level of reduction that we, uh, we're aiming for. So it's really going to take uh, government and policy to work together with finance and, and all of the other actors in the system to, to deliver on that. So when you've been looking at um, some of the investment managers' engagement with companies that they're investing and their practices, what has been a good example of short-term concrete actions in terms of decarbonisation? We've seen a lot of action from uh, investment managers on Climate Action 100 Plus asset owners as well, uh, really aiming at getting the disclosures they need from companies to make decisions on how they're going to allocate their capital and how they're going to continue to engage. So that's certainly been important. But we've also seen action on uh, decarbonisation aspects that perhaps haven't been considered more recently. For example, things like obligations that oil and gas companies might have when they have to close down some of their fossil fuel assets. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on methane emissions this year. So um, there's a lot of focus on areas that haven't necessarily been right in the core of the conversation over recent years. So they're certainly taking action in those areas. But again, there's the, the age old um, engagement versus divestment questions. Some, um, some managers are reconfiguring some of their portfolios so that they're Paris aligned or 1.5 degree aligned now, but there's also a recognition that most asset managers do have to invest in the world as it exists, not the one that we would like to see. And so there's more of an emphasis there on the engagement with companies and what stewardship actions and escalations they're going to take. And I'm sure that will go on for, for years to come. The uh, engaged versus divestment uh, debate mm. rages on. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and what would you, coming back to COP28, what would be on your wish list of announcements on Finance Day? I think there are still a few unresolved um, issues, I guess, from previous COPs. The, the big triumph of last year was the Lost and Damage Fund, which was more of a promise to set one up, but it still isn't actually funded. So mm. I think progress on that is going to be important to a lot of the developing nations. Meanwhile, there's also the long-running uh, $100 billion question, that, that $100 billion a year that's been promised by developed nations uh, to uh, emerging nations uh, to deal with the effects of um, climate change adaptation. Mm. If there's no evidence that that has ever been hit, uh, the president of COP28 is quite keen to, to see that uh, fulfilled. And so um, we'll see if that, that comes, to, comes to fruition. Mm. Do you think we'll be, get there or do you think we're going to be left disappointed again? 
there's not a lot of point to these conferences if we're not going to be optimistic. So I'm going to <laughs> choose to be on the optimistic side and say I hope that, that we can reach a, a solution, but we'll just have to see how that, that works out. Okay, fantastic. Well, thank you very much for sharing your insights, predictions. We'll have a chat after COP28 and see how, how we've got on. Looking forward to it. Thanks.